We've got perhaps the most high-powered panel that we could possibly get for this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, Professor Ian Chubb is Australia's chief scientist. Secondly, the Honourable Gail Gago, MLC, who is South Australia's Minister for Science. And some of you may not know that she is a former nurse and has an uh, honours science degree in psychology. And also uh, Dr Liana Reid, who we've just met, uh, who is the new chief scientist for South Australia. Would you please make them very welcome. Now, the format of the discussion this afternoon is that we will be having uh, a, a, a preliminary discussion between ourselves, uh, and then we will be opening up to questions from the floor, and also two questions from online. So if you're following uh, the live stream, you can ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag ECRChat, or you can uh, enter your questions in the chat roll at the bottom of your screen. So let's start with the introductory comment or the introductory conversation. The political landscape affecting research in Australia. Ian, on a national level, what is that landscape look, uh, looking like at the moment? Um, <coughs> Ploughable. <laughs> I think uh, I think that there is an opportunity now to uh, get the relevant people in government to uh, take real notice of the um, need that we have in Australia for science, <coughs> for STEM generally, uh, but through all aspects. So last uh, Tuesday, I think it was, we released this, so I can recommend you go and have a read on the Chief Scientist website. Uh, it's a strategy for Australia's future in science, for STEM generally. Uh, the Minister with Carriage, Ian McFarlane, attended and spoke. Um, the press has been remarkably positive. The BCA has come out and supported it, which in the context is important. Um, the chair of the BCA was uh, quoted again in the newspaper this morning supporting it, or a couple of parts of it in particular. So I think that there is an opportunity. I, I get a sense that the um, tide has changed a bit. Um, the real question for us collectively is how to make sure that we keep it, um, or, or keep the turning as it were, and, um, and that requires effort from all of us, not just uh, one or two. So I say often to people, you know, we had an, I was at the Eureka Awards last night in Sydney, and, um, and it's a good event and we celebrate achievement and so on. But if that's all we do, that becomes a spike. That's, that's forgotten tomorrow afternoon, except by the winners and perhaps the losers or the ones who didn't win, let me put it that way, they aren't really losers. But, um, but, but to maintain a high threshold, we've just got to keep going. It's, it requires passion, it's, it requires persistence, it requires patience. You've had a surprisingly positive uh, attitude to the current political climate for science on a national level. Um, so that, you know, we've had, although uh, we don't have a national min uh, minister for science uh, anymore, although there's been cuts across the board, you do seem to be able to see some light at the end of the tunnel, some positives in that whole landscape? Well, it's interesting you say it. I was described in uh, a newspaper on Monday as the government's harshest critic, so... I guess it depends on how you read the words, Paul, or how you hear them. But, but I, I would, I would, uh, it, it, it's it's true to the extent that, of course, I've expressed my disappointment with what happened in the last budget. I, I did that before the budget was released. I've done it uh, um, uh, subsequently. But do you always look backwards and lament uh, what was done and what? Uh, what, um, for whatever reason, uh, decisions were made at a particular time, or do you actually get over it and say, well, what, what, what is created by those changes? And I think that one of the, one of the things that is potentially, and I, and I emphasise potentially, one that's been uh, potentially created is the opportunity for some strategic reinvestment in appropriate areas. Now, and I think that we need to see it in those terms. I mean, I can, I can, you know, 
shout from rooftops about how horrible it was in the last budget. I could join the um, crowd of people who continue to say that. But in, in my position, in reality, I've got to think about what it's going to be like next year and the year after and the year after that and by 2030, not, not what it was like in 2012 and 2011 and 2010. So, to, to um, seek to get change, I think you can express your disappointment and move on and try to get positive change. Let's uh, have a look at the South Australian situation mm. at the moment. Uh, Minister Gago, uh, you are the Minister for Science uh, uh, in your portfolio. I am. <laughs> and and uh, we have a, a state policy on science. Can you mm. briefly describe for those of us here and uh, mm. those following across the nation online, mm. uh, what that landscape is. What's mm. the state landscape mm. for po science in poli the, politics? Um, in indeed we do. Um, in South Australia we have a, a Minister for Science um, and we also have a, a science policy, science strategy, which uh, thanks to uh, Don Bursell and uh, Leanna Reid, who uh, were both um, integral in um, developing that policy. It's called Investing in Science. It was developed over I think, three years, was it, Don, of engagement with um, the industry. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, sound policy. It has seven pillars within it and about 41 actions uh, within that. Um, and many of those are already well underway. Some of them we've already achieved. Uh, but m most of those recommendations are underway. The uh, 41 actions that were recommended uh, by the Premier's uh, Science Council, which um, uh, uh, was the board sort of responsible for assisting in putting it together, all of those recommendations were endorsed by the government and it now has become our, our state um, policy. So um, it, it's, we're very proud of that um, policy. We are deeply disappointed that there is no uh, federal or Commonwealth um, Minister for Science and um, deeply concerned that there's no national uh, policy or strategy and obviously um, very concerned about what the impact of those almost one billion dollar cuts uh, to science across the nation uh, will have, not only just in, here, in South Australia but you know, right across the nation. Um, so uh, we, we are concerned about those. We would very much, um, we very much believe that there should be a national strategy which helps um, uh, articulate clear national priorities and direction uh, and helps coordinate the activities of the states uh, and um, uh, so each jurisdiction which is out there doing its own thing at the moment. So, uh, you know, and there's the opportunity for there to be um, duplication and inefficiencies within that are uh, uh, much greater if there's not a national plan to help you know, provide the beacon and the guidance. Um, so we'll certainly be working very hard to encourage uh, the Commonwealth Government to, uh, to commit to a strategy and obviously South Australia is very keen to work uh, with the uh, Commonwealth um, to input into that and we think we've got some very good, uh, some very good foundations to show them uh, how that might be done or, and, and contribute in a positive way. Um, I'd also just like to take this opportunity to say that, um, uh, that I am the State Science Minister and I've been um, Science Minister for about five months. So um, I'm, I'm also very new and I've probably got uh, uh, this, a lot to learn from you and probably more than you've got to learn from me. Uh, so I'm, I'm obviously looking forward to, to the exchange. But it's a very exciting time here in South Australia. We have many challenges, as you know. We have, um, have relied historically on a um, very traditional um, uh, manufacturing uh, economy uh, with, uh, underpinned by the automotive industry. That's, um, uh, that's gone or that, that will be going. Um, there are also now big question marks over the federal government's commitment to defence, um, we, so we need to be um, watching that space. We have the, uh, the uh, objective of having to transform our economy from a traditional manufacturing basis 
to one that is uh, of more advanced manufacturing, one that is able to value add up uh, the supply chains. And I'm completely convinced that one of the key factors, enablers, um, for South Australia to successfully be able to transition is science. You know, it's, that's, that's where our creative energies uh, will come from that will to assist us in that transition. So we must, uh, you know, we must commit uh, to um, science endeavours and we must uh, get it right. Liana, this is somewhat unfortunate that it's our very first opportunity on stage together. I hope it's not the... Uh, the I, I do hope that it's the first of many, and yet I feel I've got to put you on the spot a little, uh, seeing as you're sitting next to your minister and, uh, and you're only relatively new to the job, but what do you see as your role? Uh, what duties do you see you should be doing as the state chief scientist? As I mentioned, uh, providing fearless advice, whether anyone wants to listen to it, um, and, and that's particularly to government, but also to industry and, and the research sector, and get the advice back. So I see myself as a conduit to uh, help develop the policies in the state that will uh, promote science and its uh, application. Uh, you can't do everything as chief scientist. Uh, you have to say, well, look, these are my key areas at the moment. Uh, and I, as I said before, I think the key areas for me right now, I think STEM education is really bubbling along. There's going to be the, a biggie, uh, probably more than we have done in the Science Council in the last few years, um, because I think it is so important to, to build that and build not just kids going into science, uh, but also an awareness of science. And um, Ian has done some very important surveys, which many of you have hopefully seen, of some very alarming data about uh, the ignorance of the value of science to our lives, uh, like how many people think science is important to the everyday life, not much. Um, what was the latest one, about 37% thought that negatives outweighed the benefits in? I mean, that is astounding when you think of, you know, have, then I'll go and take antibiotics or uh, even just the lighting systems, these video systems and so forth. Uh, level of ignorance is appalling. So that's, that's a, a key, uh, partly why STEM as a general understanding in the community is important too. But the other aspect of STEM I want to pursue too is entrepreneurship. Um, I think Australia is a complacent country. We've had it too good for too long. Maybe we need a crisis, I often say, as a, as a key area. Uh, because it's, uh, you know, life's good. You know, we, we just go along, everything's fine. But I don't think the future is fine. We, it, we, we can make it fine, but we've got a lot of effort to do. And part of that is, um, you know, I, I see people come into the country from overseas and they're, they're seeing business opportunities on every corner. Whereas it seems to me uh, we homegrown just say, oh, yeah, well, I'm not going to do that. Can I ask the audience a question? How many of you are thinking of setting up your own company? So well, we have two. I, I, sorry, I, I for, can't, for, those can't at, uh, for those at home, uh, we have an audience here of uh, looking at about 100, 120 people and we had... Three hands, was it? I saw two, two but... Two, two hands go yeah, up uh, there. So we, I, I remember someone telling me he was um, lecturing engineering and, and doing fairly traditional engineering courses. And he said, he asked this question and almost no one, same sort of response that we got here. Uh, he, they then introduced entrepreneurship training into the degree courses. So understanding business systems, what you do to set up a business, um, understanding finances and so forth. Um, you know, I remember when I first set up a medical research institute, someone came and asked me about the balance sheet, and I said, what's a balance sheet? <laughs> I've soon learnt. <laughs> but, uh, so understanding all those stuff, that, and, and so that you understand what it takes and, and how exciting it can be. And, and he said that when he asked that question again after that had been introduced, about half the people said they were going to set up their own company. So I think that's a sort of a, they're the kinds of things I want to focus on. The audience that we have uh, is early career researchers. Uh, these are young minds uh, really in, uh, at, at the beginning of careers in, in the sciences. What take home messages have you got for them on sci uh, with respect to science policy? And I see that as a two part question. 
what input should they expect to have or uh, should they be looking to experience, but also what should they be taking from the political and uh, policy framework for science. Let's start on a national basis, Ian. Inputs well, and outputs of ECRs into the policy framework. Well, I think, I think that the... Um, I mean, what we, what we are trying to do and the thing that we released uh, last week is a strategy from the federal government's perspective about some of the things that it should be doing to ensure that Australia has a prosperous future that it earns rather than one that it digs up and sells. Uh, because sooner or later we'll either get to the bottom of the holes or there won't be anything left that anybody wants to buy anyway. So we, we need to change uh, the paradigm, we need to change the culture, um, and we need to change the way we think about going about all of these sort of issues, and particularly with respect to STEM, starting with education. So we've got four pillars. We've got education, we've got competitiveness, we've got research, and we've got international engagement. And I'll respond to questions about any of those four later. But, but basically, if we're going to change it, then we need to make sure that the pipeline, that our, that our aspiration uh, for the country is clearly articulated and... In, in my terms, then I want to see how we adjust the economy to help us achieve our aspiration rather than have the aspiration that's left after, as I put it in a speech recently, the economic trimmings have worked their way through the digestive system of the community. So I'll leave you to think of the single word that um, I had in mind when I was writing that. But, <laughs> but, the, um, but, but, it, but it is important that we actually begin to think about what we want to be and what we want to achieve. Now, Part of my responsibility is to get um, advice and comment from as many people as I can, especially people at the, uh, uh, a lot younger than me, because sooner or later they're going to have to look after me when I get old. So, so um, it, well, when I get older. So, so it's self-interest. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's important. But, but, but the real issue for government is to make sure that we see it as a whole. So if you go back and look in Australia... Australian history in this area over a period of time, you will see piecemeal approaches. You'll see, oh, you know, we'll put a bit more money into that or we'll take a bit of money out of there, we'll put a bit of money over there. But the whole thing is actually connected. So there's no point, for example, in saying, in my view, that we will be the food bowl of anything when we know that our rainfall patterns are shifting away from where we traditionally grow wheat and grains of all descriptions and so on. And, and that we're going to actually have to do things differently. There's no point in saying we will be the food bowl without looking after the research to make sure we have the capacity to live up to that promise or aspiration. There's no point in, in, in thinking about doing the research if we're not thinking about how we can actually provide the educational pipeline to make sure we've got the people who can do the research that can look at how we, how we develop our agricultural industry over a period of time. And, and how we then live to the aspiration that we will be the food bowl of something, assuming that that's a sensible thing to say. It's a sensible aspiration, but not in the, in the most particular, you know, being the food bowl of Asia is um, inconceivable, but we can, we can contribute substantially more to the diets of people around the world, but we need to be careful about how we go about it and selective. So my advice to early career researchers is don't be silent. I mean, the whole point about it is um, that the input needs to come from people who have got skin in the game. I have, for a particular reason, um, but uh, you have more because uh, it's your future we're really talking about. So, um, and, and there are ways in which that can be achieved and there's an early career researchers large group that I go to see every year, mostly every year and talk to them about what their hopes and aspirations are and then they can get built into things like this through people like me who have access um, that nobody else in this room has got. Um, they, uh, and very few people elsewhere. So it depends on how you, how you make the context. It depends on being, of course, realistic. You've got to... You know, so I want to achieve things. I don't want to just write things. So I just, you know, anybody writes things. So how do these guys get involved in that discussion, in that dialogue? What's the, the pragmatic way in which their voices can be heard? Well, the pragmatic way is to, is to be involved in the professional societies that they belong to, the conference processes, the, the associations, the groups like that who are 
who should be encouraged to contribute to these discussions more than they do. I mean, my criticism of the Australian science community is that it's too quiet. I mean, it's all very well. You know, I got asked a question yesterday about, uh, on the ABC, I think it was on this morning, about Australia not having a science minister. I gave the standard response, which I've given since the ministry was announced, that I don't care what a person is called. There is symbolic significance, but putting that to one side. Um, I don't care what a person is called as long as they're passionate about science and they get it into Cabinet. And in my life I've seen some really effective science ministers and I've seen some science ministers that you would be reluctant to give a glass of water on a hot day. Um, and, and what is the point of the latter? Just because they carry a title. So, so what we have to try to do is to get influence that, that by talking to people locally, by talking through groupings and, and, and professional bodies, by being part of the Early Careers Researchers Forum that, that has at least, uh, I know, one meeting a year because I usually, as I say, I've been there two or three times, and, and continue talking about it, but talk locally too. I mean, I can go out there and talk, and people say, oh, that's really good, you know, Australia's chief scientist says, let's have more chemistry. Um, the real point is, why do you do what you do? Mm. Why do you think it's important? How can you express it in terms that people who are not scientists will understand? I mean, how do we, how do we lift the level of engagement? Another figure that I used in a talk I gave last night was that in, in the US they did a survey and they asked people to name a scientist and 65% of them couldn't. And in Europe they said, name a woman scientist who's made any contribution at any time in human history and 25% couldn't name one. The threshold is too low. If you want the support and you want to, to shift the way we think about these things, then you've got to be out there talking about it. Why is it important? What's the significance? Why is it important to do basic research? How do the ideas get turned into other things, depending on who you're talking to? All of those issues are important and we should be engaged in them all. It's a long answer, sorry. No, no, no. An enlightening answer. But if we, if we can now maybe move on to the state situation, does the difference of scale and the difference of distance mean that here in South Australia, these guys will have a, a, their voice will be more likely to be heard. Uh, they'll mm. have a greater opportunity for participation in state policy. Well, I think you're right, uh, Paul, because it's a smaller community, uh, it's, um, it's, it's easier to get around and it's easier to ensure that when we consult that um, key players are involved in that process. and. Uh, Don led the consultation with our, um, our uh, state policy and um, uh, ordinary, sci ev ordinary everyday scientists were involved in that and I think that's made, it made easier by the size uh, and shape of South Australia. Um, most South Australians, about 80% of our population is in Adelaide or, or the, and surrounds, so we're all concentrated in pretty much in one area. So that does make it easier. But uh, I mean, my advice um, to you is the, the work that you do and will be doing uh, will change the face of the earth. Um, it is critical uh, that you are active in that space and active uh, in, a, in uh, uh, as many ways as you can be through your, you know, your social media, through your uh, professional organisations, through your industry organisations, industry groups. Um, depending on where you're employed, um, uh, uh, and social media. The scientists are very good at beavering away, uh, uh, doing, you know, doing your day-to-day -day work. What scientists, and I agree uh, with Ian, what scientists are uh, not good at doing is promoting what you do in a way that ordinary Australians uh, can understand that. And um, to get the traction that you need, uh, you've got to be able to, to translate what, what you do into that very ordinary language. And, you know, it's, it's a tough climate. I was at, uh, yesterday or the day before, I, I just, it's, um, it's been a busy week, I, we launched with Adelaide City Council and Cisco 
South Adelaide was the first city to sign up to uh, the Internet of Things and, and sign up to a memorandum of understanding where we were going to, uh, committed to opening up an innovation hub here in Adelaide. The first in Australia, the first, it's you know, where devices talk to devices, you know, the potential for it to change um, you know, the, the way we live, uh, the way we manage our cities, the way we manage traffic, water, parking, you know, it, it, just everything um, is astounding. And we put out a, a media alert, not one local media outlet turned out to, to cover it. We had, mm. we had the vice president from um, Bangalore um, video conference in. We had these international leaders basically in the room uh, talking uh, about this, um, this first for, uh, for Adelaide. Not one uh, local media uh, outlet turned up. Uh, so it's, it's, that's the space we have to enter. That's the void that we're operating in. Um, and you all, each and every one of you, have to be uh, a loud, vocal spokesperson uh, for, your, for uh, the science sector and uh, you know, for, the, for the work that you do. Um, get active, you know, get organised. Um, I, I certainly, there's no reason why we couldn't have a science action group here in Adelaide, uh, you know, from, from a, a ground up uh, organisation, uh, a lobby group. Um, I, I invite you to consider uh, doing it. Uh, I but, can see the placards now. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful movement. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's just no reason we can't, you, you couldn't mm. organise yourself in that way or, or any other way that um, you, you deem appropriate. But um, certainly from, a, from an early um, uh, career point of view. I, I just put in a little plug for our um, investing in science policy. There are a couple of actions that you would be interested in if, uh, if you haven't had a look already. We've, um, part of the actions are increasing the number of uh, research fellowships per year, increasing the number of catalyst early career research grants, uh, introducing new grants to provide up to five collaborative projects uh, for um, early and mid-year career researchers uh, and obviously working with um, universities to help develop opportunities for early career researchers. And just last night, Leanna, I was uh, out at Regency TAFE and uh, the um, University of Adelaide in partnership uh, opened up a new entrepreneur uh, course uh, uh, for the food and wine sector. Uh, which, which is just brilliant. Now, we need one of those in every single uh, part of the industry where for, you can do from a certificate two or three qualification right up to a, a master's. You know, they are the sorts of... Um, uh, that's the sort of assistance that, that you, you, you need to be exploring uh, a range of, of ways of doing things rather than just sitting in a lab somewhere. And uh, with all due respect, I, I know that you, you want to hear what these people have got to say, but that's not really an invitation to come in and have a cup of tea. Uh, that would be logistically a difficult way to manage it. And that perhaps it's through the chief mm, scientist yes. uh, and through your work and the council. that, mm. that uh, the, the early career researchers can make their voice heard to government? Yes, we have. I mean, I think in South Australia now it is a, is a good time, and, and, and I'll say this because Gail, you would say, she would say that, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think our state government does actually get the importance of science. And I, and I think this is the first time that I, that I would say this. Um, probably we get it for the wrong reasons, that life's tough, um, but I think, you know, we've talked rhetoric about innovation and so forth, but... I think there is a seriousness about it now. We have on the Economic Development Board, which is really the powerhouse council in the state. Um, science and innovation is in two key working groups of that. One to build commercialisation and activities from universities itself. The other one evaluating in, uh, in industries. 
Uh, and then we have the Premier Science Industry Council, which takes the bigger picture look at things. And so it's our council there, I think, to say particularly that you might want to give input in as to what you think could be strategies for this uh, state. And this seems to me an, an ideal forum. If, if you collectively come together with uh, uh, concepts and agree there's a consensus position, um, it's probably better than a whole lot of individuals because that gets unmanageable. So use this forum and other network opportunities that you have to uh, uh, put your case forward. Ian, you had a point to raise. Well, I just wanted to um, emphasise a couple of uh, slightly different points. I think, uh, and, and all, of, all of what's just been said is important and an important element. And, and when I say what I'm about to say, I'm not saying it's all one thing or the other. But when I did my PhD, my assumption was that I would get a job just like my supervisors, uh, and I did. Um, I, uh, um, it was also assumed in my generation that somehow getting a PhD entitled you to do whatever you wanted to do for the rest of your life funded by the taxpayer. And I regret to tell you that that's not the case anymore. And, and so the real issue is how do we grapple with the sort of preparation that PhD students are getting, the environment within which, which they will enter when they, when they complete their degree. And, you know, I'd like us to think of a few radical options. I mean, I don't know whether successive postdocs is a way forward. We can create postdocs because the reason is you can always turn them off again. You know, money gets a bit tight, we'll have six and not 12 or zero instead of 10 or whatever it might be. And, and these are, these are um, you know, basically, as you all know, I have no doubt, um, and as I guess I did to people in my relative youth when I had a nice secure job, um, I got them on postdocs too, but, and to work in my lab. But, but I, think that, I think that now when I look at it, I think that we've got our employment in research the wrong way around. I would actually be quite radical, and I tried to do this when I was Vice-Chancellor at ANU, and probably it didn't work as well as I would have liked because we didn't, um, uh, well, I didn't stay there long enough to make sure that it did. But, um, but I would rather give really smart young people two things. A different sort of PhD training, which does indeed prepare you for research. I'm not saying it's not about research, but it brings other things into it too, so that your horizons are widened and broadened rather than narrowed through. You know, like me, I knew more about three amino acids in the active centre of one enzyme than anybody in the world for a week. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful. I had a few beers during that week and then I went into a significant depression for a week. But, but, it, was, but, it, but it was the way life was. It's different now. So, so, as Leanna said, we've got to get more people with PhDs in our industry, in our commercial world. You know, Australia has something like 8.8 .8 researchers per thousand in the workforce. Um, eight of those are in research, in, inside universities and publicly funded institutions. We have about 0.8 elsewhere. Germany has about eight researchers. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. Um, we have 8.8 .8 or so doctorates in the workforce eight of whom are in research jobs. Germany has something like 20 doctorates in the workforce, eight of whom are in research jobs. The US is about 12 or 13, uh, with eight in the research workforce. So, so we've got a completely different profile. It's the profile we've got to change. So I do two things. Change the way PhD um, programs are, are prepare people and offer opportunities up and, and, and show uh, what opportunities are available, with some, of course, continuing on a research path like the one that I did, um, but others doing other things. And the second one is that I would sort of look at how you could reverse and give young people, smart young people, meeting certain criteria, sort of not, not a three-year postdoc, but a 15-year period, and then you go on to contracts. So I've lived most of my life on five-year contracts, you know, once I sort of stepped outside the academic world, and it didn't kill me off or anything. Um, you, you do have to work a bit, and you've got to meet certain criteria. But, but we tend to give people, if they're lucky enough to get a job, a continuing employment, they stay in that. In the meantime, a succession of postdocs pass through their lab. Whereas I reckon we've got it the wrong way around. I think we should give early people 15 years worth of contract, and then you go on to five-year contracts. And if you're any good, you'll, you'll float very high. 
and if you're not, you won't, and if you're not, you shouldn't at taxpayers' expense. You can do that at your own. I just want to quickly go around uh, the panel to get a, a reaction before we go to questions from the audience. Uh, rising out of the, the old observation that came from Barry Jones that scientists were the wimpiest bunch of lobbyists he ever come across. Uh, update to last week, or was it this week, when uh, Ian McFarlane described scientists as precious petals. Is, <laughs> is the point of communication that we need to keep in focus, you're there to talk, not whinge? Is there too much whinging coming from the science sector? Uh, or is there more ra reasoned, rational presentation of the, the messages and the contributions that they can make to society? Minister, would you have a um, comment on that? Mm, the, I, I think... Um, I think science is generally a fairly um, neutral zone, it's sort of fairly apolitical. Uh, and um, I, I think it's time to get political. <laughs> I really do. Um, so I, I think whinging, uh, you know, whinging uh, gets, gets no one anywhere. Uh, it needs to be, you know, you need to be engaged in a constructive dialogue. Uh, and, and that dialogue needs to be two ways. And um, you know, we've already spoken about um, how, how you might engage yourself uh, better in that dialogue. But um, I, I just don't think you can be vocal enough. Um, but it needs to be, in, as I said, in, in, a, in, a, constructive, in a constructive way. Um, uh, but I certainly don't think scientists are, are precious petals. <laughs> well, they're precious. precious. Yeah, yeah. They're very precious. Um, but but I, I just think there's um, plenty of room to be far more vocal and far more engaged uh, in policy and other decision making uh, and for the general public to understand your value better. The, and I think there is a, a significant disconnect between the work that science does and the contribution that it makes, both economically and you know, socially, environmentally. Um, and I think there's just not enough um, description or dialogue ex being able to explain that that economic, social, and environmental value. So I, I think we just have to be much better at doing that. All right. Particularly the economic arguments. Poli particularly politicians love to know, um, you know, what the economic bottom line is, uh, and uh, science doesn't easily lend itself to providing that economic analysis. Uh, I must move things along because time is getting away from us and it is a, an opportunity for you and the audience to raise any questions that you have of our panel this afternoon. If you do have a question, please raise your hand and we will get a, a microphone to you. Uh, and I've got a question upstairs as well, Kieran. So uh, first of all, uh, you'll just have to wait a moment while we get a camera on you. Uh, <laughs> I know uh, this, is, this is the big time. Could you please state who you are and where you're from and then your question, please. Hi, my name is Sandra Bradley. I'm from Flinders University. I'm a PhD candidate with Care Search, and my topic area is around death and dying. Um, I loved everything that you had to say. I would give my eye teeth to have a permanent contract for at least five years. Um, I've been in and out of research for 30 years on, in different ways. Um, but my focus is on death and dying. Australia has 400,000 plus baby boomers in this state and people normally die between 70 and 90, and the first of those boomers will reach 70 in two years' time. That means we have an extra 10 to 20,000 deaths per year to deal with in South Australia. We've only got 12,000 a year at the moment across the age range. The South Australian government has been fantastic in trying to identify the extent of this with the Advanced Care Directive Act and the new Advanced Care Directive form. So my question in relation to that background is how do we prepare the community for an increase in death and dying, how do we, how do we prepare them scientifically to accept that there's a change about to occur? Hmm, Minister, the signs of mortality. Yes. 
Um, uh, yes, uh, I mean that's incredible um, uh, uh, information that you've given in terms of um, that analysis. Um, it's obviously not an area that I have a great deal of knowledge or expertise in. Um, but I guess from a general policy perspective, um, to, it's, it's, it's a critical that you can take, that you need to be able to take the community with you, that you need to be able to, um, particularly if you're investing public money, um, uh, 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 trying to implement a program of change, you need a, a change strategy uh, that addresses you know, key stakeholders, those um, um, members of the public with an interest, which in, your, in this case, um, most people, uh, and um, ensure that that information gets out there through a whole range of different um, conduits. So Ian, you had a comment? Yeah. Well, I, I think it also goes back to what we were talking about before, and that is communication. I, I think that there's been a tendency in the science community that they uh, talk amongst themselves for quite a bit. So take climate change, right? So there's a lot of discussion primarily amongst the scientific community for a very long time. Then it comes out in the public and it's, and it, and it's represented at least by some as a calamity. And the public did, weren't aware, of it. They, they weren't brought along the path so that as things as you become aware of things, you're constantly reinforcing the public debate, the opportunity for public debate about it. And this is exactly the same issue. There's no point starting the debate when it's happening. You've got to start the debate now. And so we've got to prepare for this so that when it does happen, the community at least is aware, has been engaged in some form or some elements in the community have been seriously engaged. And, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I think that we don't do well at science. We talk to each other. We use our own peculiar techo talk and vocabulary. Um, but when we take it out into the community, it tends to be at the point, And it needs to be much earlier. So you're bringing the community along with you as you go, particularly these things that have got far-reaching implications for a community. Climate, vaccination, pandemics. All of these things ought to be a constant part of the public discussion so that when an event occurs, then the public is at least had the opportunity to be informed. If they haven't chosen to take the opportunity, that's a different matter, but they've had the opportunity. And that's our obligation to give them. We have a question up on the mezzanine. Do we have a camera on there? Your question, please. Uh, could you identify yourself first, please? Uh, I'm Stefan caddy Ritalik. I'm from the University of Adelaide. I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, and my question is for Professor Chubb. Um, Dr. Reid talked about how um, she felt that the South Australian government gets science and, um, and how she takes um, some, com com some confidence in that. Um, over the past year, we've seen a number of federal cabinet ministers make comments um, that wouldn't be supported by the majority of the scientific community around the causes and amelioration of climate change effects um, and the links between um, uh, abortion and breast cancer for example, um, do you think that the federal federal cabinet gets science? Is that a, a feeling that you share at a federal level? Well, it would be hard to say yes. Um, <laughs> uh, but they're getting it better, uh, and I think I think that's that's really the point that has to be made. I think if you look, for example, at some of the more recent comments uh, from Minister McFarlane, who is the minister with responsibility for science in the cabinet, um, then I think that they've been, uh, generally speaking, quite supportive, quite understanding of uh, the need to do something. He spoke at the launch of our proposed strategy, I thought, um, very positively. Um, the Prime Minister has been making some very positive statements in the last couple of months uh, about the importance of STEM, the centrality of STEM to Australia's competitiveness, to Australia's industry policy. Um, and, uh, but, you know, 7% of the federal parliament has a background in STEM. In the community, it's 20 odd percent, so why aren't half of you in parliament? I mean, these are the sort of changes that we do have to make, I'm afraid. And, um, and the, uh, uh, so, you know, regrettable statements will always be made by um, politicians. I mean, that's 
I doubtless there are many in the newspaper today that we mightn't uh, appreciate. But, but, but generally speaking, I don't think that there are people that I meet in federal politics of, in any, from any party who are willfully destructive. Some of them are not as well as informed as we would like them to be. Uh, and I think it's my role, it's your role, it's all of our collective role, really, to make sure that we provide that better information. And when they do make statements, I mean, the statement about abortion and breast cancer didn't last five minutes before it was uh, um, commented on, criticised, um, the, the record corrected um, by people who really knew about the... Um, uh, the evidence that, that uh, uh, is now available. So, and I think that's what we have to keep doing, getting the right message out there constantly. Uh, we've got to talk to the politicians. As I say, I, I see federal politicians working really hard uh, with a whole complex agenda, with a whole set of priorities, and I don't know too many, there might be some, but I don't know any, who were willfully trying to be destructive. I think they just need to be better informed. Let's move along because we do have got a few more questions to get through. Uh, have we got a, we've got a camera on you, so please identify yourself and ask your question. Uh, so Drew Evans from University of South Australia, a Senior Research Fellow. I guess uh, much of what's been spoken about is we need cultural change, Some, something that's not going to happen overnight and it's going to take, a, a, I guess, a lot of things to happen to drive that change. A question I have is a lot of the examples about how early career researchers can get involved is, I guess, going through the channels of providing advice as a group that gets taken into account in a policy document that eventually makes its way through to, I guess, the end user. A question for the, the panel is, what advice or, I guess, tricks and, and so on that you can provide to give ECRs the inspiration or, I guess, the direct link to drive this cultural change rather than just being someone in the lab that sent an email to someone that got collated into a report that two years later something was done. So what advice do you have about actually ECRs driving the change rather than just being a, one part of a, the puzzle? Hmm. Leanna, would you like to take off on that one? You have to give us the tough ones, don't you, Drew? It's not, <laughs> the fact that Drew's on our Premier Science Industry Council is no uh, surprise. <laughs> he always comes up with the hard questions. It is a tough one, Drew. A cultural change doesn't happen um, quickly, generally. Although I would say in science particularly, uh, scientists are very clever people. Uh, and if the carrots change, uh, people will change quickly. So uh, I think driving for changes in carrots would be uh, one suggestion. So, um, you know, I think we've all heard the arguments about the era driving research towards the publication side of things and the basic research as opposed to the more applied. So, for example, if he was early stage researchers said, well, look, you know, we think cultural change needs to occur and one of the solutions is to um, have a change towards measuring impact more on the outcomes. I'm sure, I reckon we'd get a cultural change pretty quickly uh, because I think we've seen it, the pendulum swing. It's a balance. We don't want to get rid of basic research by any means, but there's a, but there's a general view the pendulum swung too far away from impact. How do we swing it back again? So some of those sort of things. I think you as young researchers are probably the key people to influence culture at the, uh, in, in even the younger people. I mean, the people at, at high school, primary school, that side of things too, getting that change across and, uh, uh, because they will, they will really pay attention to you as young researchers, whereas someone old like me, they'd just say, well, you know, what has she got to say with anything? But, so, you know, it's a, it's a difficult thing, but I think a number of strategies that you guys can play an important role in. Uh, a couple of questions have come in from uh, uh, online. Uh, at Coalfacer asks uh, of you, uh, Ian, um, your comments on the science lobby and scientists as precious petals. We did touch on this, but how did you react to that, when that specific phrase, precious petals? What does that say? Well, I thought there was one word too many. <laughs> You can pick which one. <laughs> no, I think I think it's I think you can be precious in the, the the positive sense of precious, and I think science is precious to this country. Um, I think um, uh, you know I, I too got asked last evening for the 
50th time what I thought about the lack of a science minister. Um, I said what I thought and I told you earlier what I said. Um, I think the Prime Minister, uh, the um, Minister McFarlane is getting exasperated by getting the question and um, he expressed it that way. If I can uh, paraphrase Josh Hickson's uh, question from the chat role, um, should more effort be put into raising public awareness of scientific findings uh, in a similar way to the way that the Climate Council used to work? Should we be looking at more organisations like that to translate science to politics and, uh, and politicians? Uh, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the passions I want to bring to this role. And actually, if you look around, there are a number of groups, uh, even in South Australia, that um, are involved in this in various ways. I think we could get our act together better and have a combined effort more than we do, uh, because I think it's, uh, you know, a sort of a larger lobby effort saying the same thing is generally better and small groups can only do so much. So we definitely have to do that. Um, and it's partly, I, I guess, putting the excitement of science out there so that people actually realise that Wow, you know, uh, science does all this good stuff for my everyday life. Uh, educating uh, people about uh, so they, where they can make informed decisions instead of these uh, fear reactions that we're getting. Uh, Ian mentioned a, a couple of those perhaps with uh, climate change because science is always ahead of uh, policy. I think, you know, it's, it happens so quickly that uh, nanotechnology and so forth, it's easy to put scare campaigns out there. So we need that kind of of education, we need the kind of education to stimulate um, interest in careers. Um, so I'm busy trying to establish networks with the uh, local newspapers uh, and have articles written in ways that the uh, people who read the advertiser and are not scientists will understand. I'm not very good at that. My English teacher used to tell me I had too many thuses and therefores in my essays. So, so I, one of the things I specifically requested when I took the role of chief scientist was some media uh, presentation support so that we could write articles in ways that uh, will be uh, attractive and inspirational to the general public. So but there's, a, there's a lot we need to do in that area. It's a, there's no end to it. I think you've got to keep, keep at it and at it and at it. Uh, because this ignorance level of science is, is really quite appalling. I think um, also, if I could just add, pushing science um, to have a better connection with industry and the commercialisation opportunities, uh, Leanna uh, mentioned briefly earlier on, one of the things that um, uh, this state government's doing is there are, we have a, a series of grants that uh, around innovation for um, private industries and uh, part of the requirement to access that money is that uh, industry has to partner with uh, research. Uh, so th there are <coughs> sort of ca ways that we can create carrots to create certain dynamics. Uh, and uh, I think Ian mentioned uh, about um, <coughs> far too much research occur occurring in institutions. I think something like 70% of our research currently occurs in institutions and 30% out uh, in industry, whereas all of the, the successful economies, it's the opposite way around. And that's um, what South Australia, part of our strategy is to drive, um, turn that around and uh, really require industry to better engage uh, with research and also for researchers to get out of uh, their, their um, institutions and out uh, onto the ground out, out there in biz with business and industry. So there are a couple of drivers. I'd like to wrap up this session with some comments and observations from you on uh, an issue that's germane to this audience uh, on both a national and a state level, and that's the old chestnut about a brain drain, about mm -hmm. brains going interstate or offshore. Um, and to try and be a little bit provocative, I don't think it's such a bad thing because certainly in this state, they come back and when they come back, they bring with them skills and expertise that they've picked up interstate or internationally. So, Ian, have you got some words of wisdom with respect to the brain drain for this audience? No wisdom, Paul. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, um, I mean, of course, it's going to be good and bad. I mean. Probably the worst thing that I've heard in the last month about 
at this, in this particular respect was at a round table that the US ambassador ran in Canberra a couple of months ago. And um, he spoke, I spoke, and then there was a panel. And uh, somebody in the audience stood up and said, well, I've got a great idea. What would you do if you were me? Which is commercialisable eventually. What would you do if you were me? And an Australian who worked for an American company who was on the panel said, well, I'd, I'd prove it up here over the next two or three years and go offshore. Well, I don't think that's a solution to anything, actually. Um, I think all that does is create more problems for us. So we've got to get a whole lot of other settings right. Uh, to, um, to, to, to ensure that we can do what many other countries do. So the British have a really great model, which I'm hoping the federal government uh, will also embrace a version of for Australia, where they have a technology strategy board which coordinates innovation across the US, uh, UK um, and brings business and researchers together, because they have the same profile of researchers as we do, mostly in their universities and and uh, other research institutions, but their level of cooperation is something to the order of 40% of their companies interacting with the researchers, we're, we're, we're at about 4%. Um, so they do something we don't do, and I know what they do, and, and it's in there, so if you want to find out about it, I emphasize, when I don't get royalties for any of these um, <laughs> things, or downloads, or reads, but, but uh, you might find some of that interesting. But we've just got to change it, and I think we've got to start with um, doing the things that we can do now for people who are already well down the pipeline, as well as starting at primary school and beginning to change the way we think about those sorts of um, those sorts of issues. I should say, um, Minister McFarlane does see himself as the well, he is the minister with responsibility for science in cabinet, and I think um, that it is that it is our obligation to give him as much of the evidence that he needs to be able to present the case for science in Cabinet. I think he, he does have the passion about it um, and, uh, and he will take it if we give him the evidence. So we're going to do a, um, I think the Minister said earlier, politicians like economics, bottom line. I'm not a great fan of economics. I think it gets in the way of vision um, more often than not, but, um, or too often anyway. Um, but I think that, uh, although I do accept colleagues that we do need economics, um, but in the right place. The, uh, but we're doing, we're, we're doing a study at the moment out of my office to look at um, what is the benefit to the Australian economy of physics, chemistry, mathematics and earth sciences in actual dollars. And we, we expect to have the first bits of that coming out around December or so on. And we're doing it to try to answer that question. And why are we doing it? Because the British have done it. And my view is if they can do it, we can. Um, but, but it shows that it can be done. Um, it's a similar thing has been done in the European Union, but we've not tried it in Australia. And given our economy is a bit different, uh, given all of those things, then we thought it would be useful to do it. So we'll have some of those answers, which will help, I think, I hope, uh, again, let us get down and look at what our culture needs to be to succeed as we want to. Minister, a quick comments about quick. the brain drain? The, um, what we need is a brain exchange, not drain. So mm. we, we, it, it's okay for, um, for, in fact, we've, it's, it's one of those ten priorities that I talked about is South Australia being a knowledge state, and one of the pins uh, under one of the thing, key things underlying that is uh, encouraging more international student exchange, um, particularly in the research area. Um, in and out of South Australia, and I think that's a very positive thing to do. The, when, the, when the net flows out, it's a, it's a bad thing. Uh, it's, it's a very bad thing, and, uh, and South Australia is facing many challenges that you know, I've already talked about. Uh, we need to create um, sustainable, strong industry here in South Australia so that we can continue to create jobs uh, and, and be a strong, um, economically viable state. Uh, and uh, we've, we, we've got a series of um, plans to do that and a number of investments uh, that we're committed to, and science is one of those. And our new chief scientist for South Australia, what are your final comments? Well, there are several with, with answers to that drain? question. There are several, yeah. several layers of brain drain. One is, is people, 
themselves. And we certainly do have a net exit from South Australia of young, qualified people. Uh, we get number in, but the net is out that way. Um, and that's something which we need to address, and that's probably an industry-based type question. Uh, but certainly, as has been said, it's, it's uh, very important to, for people to go away and, and, and uh, uh, provided the net uh, inflow is there, um, because people you know, are magnets if they're good people. Um, and we've seen this through one of the Premier Science Industry Council's programs, our senior research fellowships attracting uh, senior people and we've attracted so South Australia is not an un unattractive place to come for science because we've attracted some uh, fantastic scientists of, a, of, of our, our lead group um, and they're they are acting as magnets they're lifting the quality of the research that's done all around them in the departments uh, and so forth so um, we are an attractive place so we don't have to have cringe factor there people will come and go and it's important they get that international experience the second level is um, loss of intellectual property, uh, and that's partly something which uh, Don has been passionate about. Is it's very easy to say you've come up with some new technology, you've patented it, for example. Um, your commercialisation arm will probably say, yeah, we can license this to uh, IBM overseas or something like this, and we'll get some royalties and so forth, and off we go. Easy to do. Uh, but what's the benefit for South Australia, or, or even Australia, if we're not as parochial as South Australia? Um, we are starting to think about um, ways that we might say, well, okay, what if we did that a bit differently? What can we build in South Australia? And it's a mindset that's bringing the expertise around that package to say, maybe we, I think we can be a lot better at keeping things here than we have in the past. Um, and finally, the third one is that the, at the industry level, um, Somehow we need to build uh, many more large companies here because they are magnets. I think if you look at the medical device industry, you could probably trace, which we do quite well in Australia, and you could probably trace everyone who set up a medical device company in Australia back to Paul Trainer, the uh, founder of Cochlear. Uh, so it's those networks and people. It's uh, getting groups and critical mass of people in an area together builds that, and it builds a, an industry and we need to do quite a bit more of that in Australia. So that we do have that brain drain of, a, of in the sense of a company saying, I'll be here, but then I'll end up overseas. So it's three levels there. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've had uh, a healthy dose of wisdom uh, about the politics uh, and science policy in Australia. Would you please put your hands together for Professor Ian Chubb, the Honourable Gail Gago, and Dr Liana Reid. <laughs>